So I think we're okay to uh, get started. Um, it's my pleasure as the uh, college's uh, New South Wales chapter uh, uh, seminar coordinator uh, to introduce our two speakers today. And you can see them on the slide, they're Tim Roberts and Jerome Carslake. I've known Jerome for many years, but uh, Tim and Tim for many weeks. The title of their presentation is Strategies for Delivering uh, Safer Fleets. Uh, but before they start, I'd like to briefly introduce them, uh, very briefly, in the essence of time. Their full biographies are contained in the flyer we sent out promoting the seminar. So um, my uh, introductions will be very brief. Jerome Carslake's a, a professional leader of the National Road Safety Partnership uh, Program. He has extensive knowledge in workplace road safety management program delivery and the uh, collaborative development of solutions for a wide range of uh, fleet safety issues. Uh, Tim Roberts is currently principal consultant with uh, Fleet Strategy, uh, which is an independent uh, fleet consultancy and has over 25 years of experience in the fleet management industry um, in operational uh, senior management and uh, government's uh, positions. And so Tim and uh, Jerome together bring with them a, a wealth of knowledge, expertise and um, experience in the area. And, and, uh, and on top of that, as you can see from the slide, um, they're two really nice guys. And so we're especially grateful uh, to both of them for agreeing to speak today. And, and thank you guys. So at this stage, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to them. But just before I do, um, just a reminder, please make sure uh, for anyone who's just um, come on in that um, if you want to shoot me questions, shoot them to me uh, during the presentation. Um, and uh, please make sure your microphones and webcams are turned off uh, during the presentation. So I'm hoping that was under five minutes. And on that note, um, uh, Jerome and Tim, um, please uh, present your um, presentation and uh, take, take control. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Sorry, my children just came home. So as always, it's always a nice experience. Hi, Jerome. How are you? I'm going well, mate. Yourself? Good, good. No, right. This is a tag team from us, so I think it's it's your way, isn't it? Yep, I'm ready to go. I'm just about sharing my screen now. Uh, here we go. All right. So, yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to say also say that uh, Mike Regan's also a fantastic guy as well, and I've known him for quite a while. So, thank you for the kind introduction, Mike. It's been fantastic. Um, so, and as I also know Tim really well, uh, we del deliver the utilities forum and uh, a lot of other elements together in regards to this space. So, uh, we've known each other since the inception when the National Road Safety Partnership Program was just a mere idea, it's evolved from that point. So um, it's always awesome to be presenting with Tim. So thanks for coming along, Tim. My pleasure, Jerome. I'm um, sorry, approach is very much in a conversational sort of style. As, um, as Mike outlined, looking around 45 minutes and 15 minutes, 10 minutes for, uh, for questions at the end, throw them on in. We love making it as interactive as possible. And if we see a few chats come up, we might try and grab them as we're going along. Um, there's a, we're hoping to get through it all, um, but there is an enormous amount we're going to hopefully cover, um, and we hope you really enjoy today's presentation. So, as mentioned, this is me and Tim. Thanks, Jerome. Um, yeah, just a little bit of context again. Firstly, uh, to Mike, David, Prasanna, um, to our audience out there, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today, and, and particularly also to Jerome um, for the privilege of being able to co-present um, as Jerome said, we have known each other since actually before the NR, uh, SPP, going back to Jerome's NTC days. And just to put some context, I guess, which will fall into place with the rest of the presentation here, um, my background is actually commercial fleet management. Um, and that's where I started. And uh, as part of a portfolio that we had, we did a lot of work with uh, state government agencies and the like. And the the aspects of fleet management that we were dealing with with state government, for instance, was probably far more sophisticated than the general marketplace. It wasn't about moving metal. It wasn't about providing finance. It was really about providing the best mobile workplace environment. So 
someday, many, many years ago, uh, close to a couple of decades ago, uh, Jerome and I had a, a couple of conversations and, and our uh, relationship has, has gone on since then. And I'd just like to say, in terms of strategy, what we're doing today is actually a demonstration of one of the key fleet management strategies, and that's challenging the need to drive. Who'd have thought it? This is something that we've all become very accustomed to over the last few months, and it's becoming a bigger part of it. I remember having a conversation only at the end of last year and the beginning of this year with a state government department on the East Coast, and uh, we were looking at initiatives, and one of the initiatives that we came up with was challenging the need to drive, and the reason for that was that they wanted to reduce their exposure on the road, and one of the ways they wanted to do that uh, was by minimising the use. And we thought if we put a 10% 10 reduction in the kilometres driven, that would be a really bullish um, target for us to achieve. And I had to ring them up a couple of months later and apologise for not putting pandemic in their initiatives and, and their strategy and their plans. So uh, you never know what's going to happen out there. Anyway. Um, sorry, do you want to go? Oh, no, I agree. I think... Um... COVID shows how adaptable we can be. I think the transport space is one which is really going to see how do we change things from this to make it a new norm as we go forward. So I don't think this is about really, this is where we sort of touch on, look at where we're going at now uh, for our whole presentation. Yeah, we, we do. And, and the, the, the evolution, I, I think, you know, fleet management and fleets are really evolutionary, not revolutionary under normal circumstances. But the evolution has to become more and more sophisticated and developing strategies um, with fleets is something that's really important. There's, there's no doubt anybody that operates a vehicle or moves people or goods or services around needs a strategy of some description. And amongst our audience today, Jerome, there'll be, there'll be a lot of variation in that. Um, every, every solution is different. But I'd probably start with having a look at asking four key questions. Um, and those questions are why. Why mobility must be managed in the workplace? And, and why have mobility in that workplace? The question of what, what fleet standards are applied and what fleet standards would aspire to. Um, the how, how as an organisation we would deliver those services or those products or those goods or that mobility. And with, with what tools and resources are we actually going to do that? And the beginning for me for any strategy is to really to ask those four key questions. And in terms of developing a strategy after that, perhaps we would look at engagement and accountability, and then a series of filters that we would apply in the development of that strategy and, and also our day-to-day -day operations. So how would you find a, uh, mobility then, Tim? What's your thoughts around that? Um, look, there's a, there's a lot of ways you could actually write a, a physical description, but it's the capacity to move people or products or services throughout the community. There's no doubt about it. Um, transport, logistics, mobility influences our lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there's very, very few exceptions to that. Um, and I would say also in, in looking at that mobility, a worker has the right to a safe workplace and an employer has the obligation to provide that safe working environment for them again. I mean, we know that driving is, is one of the greatest, if not the greatest hazard that workers face in, in their day-to-day -day activities. I think the stats reflect that. When you think about two-thirds of workplace fatalities involve a vehicle, and so an organisation has a duty of care to supply a safe workplace to a worker. Um, how diverse can mobility be, Tim? <laughs> yeah, it, it can be pretty diverse. Um, I mean, today, I guess we're going to focus more on the... The, the light fleet aspect. So that's, you know, the passengers, the SUVs and the light commercial vehicles. But in, in my experience with many fleets, particularly larger or more sophisticated fleets, firstly, there's also an element of diverse and, and heavy fleet. So, of course, we're talking trucks, we're talking logistics and transport. Uh, we could be talking elevated work platforms, cranes, forklifts. That's just the tool of trade side of things. But then there's, how do we move people around within the community? Um, goodness me, I mean, we can talk about grey fleet. Don't dare I bring that up. Um, the use of private vehicles for, for work purposes. Um, there's carpooling, there's car share. 
Um, there's my favourite, which is act, you know active transport, hopping on a bike or right, even walking to and from the job. And then there's public transport as well. So what we see nowadays is that you know, people still refer to fleets and fleet management, but it's really about mobility management and it's really about managing that those packets of um, you know, services or goods or the individuals as much as it is about the assets as well. And I think that's, and it's also evolving, it's changing. There's the double grey fleet as well. You, you touched on the grey fleet. And for those yeah. who know, the grey, the double grey is when, say, you drive over to some, and you may have your own organisations approved the use of a vehicle, which is grey fleet, you drive over to someone else, and the client then asks or requires you to drive their vehicle to somewhere else. So then you take on the risk of, is their vehicle insured, maintained, all those sort of components as well. And it may just be, Elder, older person loves being driven in their old car down to the doctors every every fortnight for, and that's that's the only time the vehicle gets used. So there's the mobility of it can be so complex. And I think what we're seeing now with COVID nineteen is another mobility um, element is around how reliable and functional Zoom, MS Teams, Google, all these other components which are coming into play. Yeah, that, that that's right. Um, I I've, I've had a look at I guess some of the delegate list here today. You know, just from the email, and and it's quite quite diverse again um, and I don't, I'm pretty certain that most people would have a good feel for what Grey Fleet is but do you just want to expand a little bit about you know that concept of Grey Fleet because I can recall yeah you know, again nearly 20 years ago discovering a tool of trade fleet that we managed with uh, five or six hundred vehicles as a standard fleet and then a representative of the Office of Road Safety in WA and um, and a consultant at the time um, came into the office and said, you've got a little bit of a problem with that fleet. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, you've got a fleet of five or 600 vehicles, but there's over a thousand vehicles which are regularly used as a grey fleet. And that's private vehicles being used for work purposes. Um, I know you've done a lot of work in that area, Jerome. Yeah, well, we touch, I think if anyone looks at it, there's the grey fleet guy, which is fantastic. And we'll touch on bits and pieces like that as we move through it all. But just, it, and we're going to explore this um, around the communities, other sort of components, how you really touch on and, and delve into it. But just as an example, one organisation which I gave, engaged with as part of the NRCP, they went from, um, didn't think they had any grey fleet problem, and they contacted me a, a few weeks later and they said, anything you're part of, we're in. And what they discovered inadvertently was they went from an organisation and they had a whole area of a couple of million kilometres, which they didn't even know existed, that they paid out in Grey Fleet. So um, a lot of people may not even recognise it's occurring. And people play, claim it back on tax as well. Um, but you still have, and this is the interesting thing, you still have a duty of care to that worker, even if they're driving their own vehicle. If they're doing work-related purposes, it makes no difference. And it doesn't matter what the CEO thinks, and we've experienced that firsthand where some CEOs think out of sight, out of mind. Um, and I guess that's really a good sort of point to move on to. And sorry, before I do, um, if you really want to explore some of the legal elements of it, we have a great document on the website, The Legal Implications, which was done by Flinders University. It touches on the law, everything that sits around it, and there's a whole lot of great hypotheticals. Um, but the reason you do it, you want the real why behind it, is you want to focus on the well-being, the service delivery, productivity, efficiency, staff retention, environment. all these other elements are all combined around why you should manage and provide a safe workplace um, when, when your workers get on the road. So um, what, what should be at the heart of your organization's mobile strategy, Tim? Um, the, the way that I tried to, try to look at it, I, I try to apply a series of filters that, that deliver, um, del deliver solutions for the entire organization. And we are gonna to touch on um, accountability and, and also engagement um, a little later, but I guess there's, there's four suggestions, and I'll, I'll, they're just uh, suggestions for, for a strategy, but I'll put them in, in context and, and frame them in a moment. And that is that what we should be looking at is the delivery of the safest mobile working environment. But, and, and we're gonna talk sort of pretty much about that the whole way through. That sits as, as number one. It's, it's the highest priority, protecting, protecting workers, protecting the community. Um, out there on the roads or any other private environment where uh, we, we're using mobile assets. Um, second to that is ensuring that they're operationally fit, uh, operationally suitable and fit for purpose. Um, it, it, it comes without saying that if the vehicle isn't suitable, then it shouldn't be used anyway. So it always kicks back into that safety piece. Uh, the third part of any strategy is obviously that they're optimised and efficient. And this comes to 
meeting the financial requirements of any organisation because there are always these influences that are going to come in and take that clinical technical solution and, and try to steer that as well. And for good reasons. I mean, there are limitations with operations and what's required. It's not necessarily the, the cheapest option, which is the most suitable option. But there again, you've obviously got the financial imperatives of government departments, private organisations and anybody else, even SMEs out there. And not to be left out or forgotten, and, and simply because it's the next step in there, is that transition to a sustainable fleet as well. Um, being green is good for business. And again, we'll, we'll maybe touch on that a little bit. Um, the best business solutions, the safest business solutions, are quite often the most efficient ones, and therefore there is a dividend going back in that. Um, and the way that I put that in context, I, I like to apply a series of filters, um, which I call C's, S-E-A-S, and that's um, safe, effective, affordable, and sustainable. So in developing a strategy, um, we're asking these questions, why first? And, and you've pretty well covered that in terms of yeah, the CORs, the well-being, um, the need to deliver a service. And the what is, is you know, the standards that are required that we aspire to. Um, four key suggestions in that space. But when we also talk about standards, we've got to, we've got to look at it from end to end. Um, we can select a safe vehicle. And again, we'll talk about you know, things like um, ANCAP, five-star selection, and fit out a little later as well. But we've got to look at how we support that vehicle in the workplace, how it operates, uh, what sort of terms and funding that we're going to have a look at. And that's really important as well, because the term of a vehicle determines how quickly we can refresh the fleet. And how quickly we refresh the fleet determines how quickly we can refresh the car parks out in the marketplace. So just those financial considerations are really important. Then there's the, the ongoing maintenance and monitoring of those vehicles as well. So we've got to have standards for for servicing, do we go with scheduled servicing? Do we go with interim servicing? Uh, what happens if we're in a harsh working environment? Um, with first response vehicles, for instance, you know, if they're involved in um, a lights and sirens call out, you know, do we have standards that we apply for uh, servicing immediately afterwards, checking the brakes and things like that? So there's this whole of life standard we have to apply from the selection of an asset its operation and even its disposal, because that will still determine the, the outcomes at the back. And then in the middle of that, of course, there are all the policies that we apply. So, I mean, Jerome, you've, you've got some, some good ideas about, you know, policies that should be involved in fleet. Well, so I guess that's where I really begin working on that how. Um, so as we talk about the standards and moving to the how, so how it should be delivered. Um, and I think key thing, and then we begin looking at them is, is it's gonna be dynamic, it's gonna be re revisited. And at the heart of it, it's always that point of, do you need to travel should be the first step. Um, is it essential? Is it, is it is the solution you have to go out on the road? Can you use an alternative? Um, the other thing that really is interesting at the moment, if you look at this whole COVID environment that's going on, it's actually creating a bit of a, a risk displacement situation as well, where some people are focusing purely on the COVID risk and, and that, that sort of split up to the top. Um, and they forget about what are the other sort of risks that are taking place out in there? As an example, one organisation, um, they sort of threw to the side the risk of fatigue in other sort of areas. So when they were sending a workforce out to a job, uh, a two hour drive, uh, they'd take four vehicles for four people, um, work on the site and then return back in because they viewed COVID as, as a higher risk than fatigue and their strategy got focused on that. So I guess the whole, is, the how is really working out where is your risk, challenging the need to travel, and the best solutions as well to be out the road and sort of prioritising how are you going to do that in a safe and efficient and effective way as well? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, when, when we look at a strategy, for instance, you know, there's a, there's a few different elements that, that would underpin that. Um, I, I, I always um, recommend with organisations that they, they have a fleet standard, a literal fleet standard, and that's that aspirational document. And the way that I kind of try to develop it is that you have a strategy framework, Beneath that sits the standard, that's what we aspire to. This is what we expect of our, our vehicle and our operators in those vehicles, I might add as well. Um, but then beneath that, we start to fill that out with a plan and that plan tells us how we're gonna achieve those goals and those ends. So um, this is a really important part of it, whether it's um, discrete initiatives um, and it might be that um, 
our strategy is about reducing our envir environmental footprint by 10%. What's the easiest way to do that? The easiest way to do that is perhaps to reduce our fuel usage. What's the easy way to, easiest way to reduce your fuel usage, given that the transition of fleets is evolutionary and not revolutionary, as, as I was saying, is perhaps to reduce the kilometres travelled, as you said, you know, and, and I've mentioned before, maybe challenging the need to drive, to look at journey management, route planning and things like that. And at the end of the day, you know, if your fuel bill is 10% less than it was, your emissions are 10% less than it was, your risk exposure for the operators of those vehicles is also substantially lower. And that's given that you're still using vehicles with the same fuel consumption and performance as well. So, yeah, it can have a, um, a significant impact on, on the strategy and the running of the fleet if you've got these discrete initiatives in place. So. I guess the final point is, is make sure we get the best tools for what we're going to be doing as well. So make sure once you've got the right sort of systems, stands in place, we've got the right sort of tools going through, and let's make sure, are we looking at the right technology elements? Uh, are we looking forward instead of, because the thing is, is times will change. Um, if you're putting a technology solution like a telematics or those bits and pieces, uh, risk, risk reduction, driver management systems, whatever you're putting in place, you need to really think about how are you going to future-proof it as well. Um, and if you understand your own sort of internal sort of systems where the risks are lying as well, you can then sort of adapt it. And you may even see certain other vehicles coming along where there might be um, a technology solution becomes standard. It might just mean delaying a changeover or something for another month or two until that comes on. And there's, there's quite a few examples where organisations are going that. And, and yeah. what would you use, Tim, is you want to avoid the Swiss Army knife? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and, and this is based on experience. Um, I, I think it's really important, and again, we'll, we'll touch on engagement shortly, but I think it's really important to, to get all the stakeholders in there, um, but also to manage that process as well. Um, the, there can be a tendency with fleets, with all the, the vested interests coming in to try and develop this all-purpose vehicle, and uh, it, it can be a bit of a camel, you know, or a Swiss army knife, where it tries to do too many things rather than being strategic and looking at elements of, uh, you know, this is a tool of trade vehicle for um, uh, air conditioning, you know, air conditioning refurbishment and repairs or something along those lines. This is one for um, uh, gas and, and jointers. This is another for, for lines people, for utilities and things like that. Just trying to be uh, very, very clear about your specifications and your strategic planning for that fleet as well. Um, again, there are other examples of, of multi-use vehicles that we could talk about, and we will do shortly, but to try and be very clear um, on the specifications and keep those vehicles as, I'd like to say standardised, but that can turn around and bite you as well, standardised as possible, um, but you've got to make sure that the stakeholders have a say in how they're created as well. You can't please everybody all the time, unfortunately, with fleet, and that's, that's quite often the case. Um, the other side of things, and we talked about, we're talking about tools and resources, is the telematics piece. And if any element of uh, an operational fleet is going to take a lot of prior preparation, it's, it really is in telematics, um, because there's some big cultural changes that come with that as well. But there are also some big opportunities if we talk about tools and resources. Um, I'm going to step right out to the, uh, the, the balmy edge of science fiction here for a minute, Jerome, if, that, if that's okay. Um, one of the big things, and you and I have talked about this, is um, access to, to data, and particularly in regional remote locations at the moment. And this is really just a bit of an illustration, but um, it was only six months or so ago I took a drive around uh, Rural Western Australia, actually, it was just a, a bit of a, a driving holiday. And outside the towns, yeah, it was quite apparent there was very little data. You know, if you're outside some of those remote towns and mine sites, uh, you had very little data. But if you look at what's on the horizon and what's actually changing now, and if I choose somebody like um, Elon Musk and Starlink, Starlink is a plan to um, to brighten the night sky to the, to the woe of astronomers, but to put in place a global network of low latency internet satellites that will be able to provide you with data connectivity wherever you are, whenever you are. So if we're coming back to strategies for fleets and safety, this horizon may be three, four, five years down the track,
but those sorts of technologies will ultimately ultimately become available. So what tools and resources will we have in the vehicle, for instance, if we've got a steady data stream and we're able to monitor the vehicle and the driver out there? So the tools and resources that we look at are the ones that deliver the best mobile workplace, safest mobile workplace environment for, for people out there. Right. Well, yeah, it's a good stage. You've got the next one now, engagement. Um, so one of the key things that always pops up is when you begin working through this is, is, is breaking down the silos in organisation. So it's really thinking about who's in your organisation's driving community. Because what happens quite often can be quite disjointed. Different groups aren't talking to each other, have different controls in place, um, performance budgets, budgets, brandings. And what you can get is a lot of conflict all happening around the place. Everyone's working against each other. Um, so the key thing in, in moving through is really understanding how you're going to get everyone together. Getting everyone sit, sitting together, working through, understanding different sort of problems. Most importantly also working, thinking about the worker that's out in the field as well, who's actually doing the job, um, who's exposed to sitting out there. And the key thing is, is understanding the different communication levels working through that. Having the CEO, the CFOs and those sort of leadership positions really understand the risks of the workplace. Because one easy example that can happen on this is the application of safety to a vehicle. This can be entirely different to what can take place in an organisation. So, for example, how many organisations have such a great concentration thinking about are the screens at the right height? Do we take down all the, all the power cords when we've got um, presentation, all this sort of stuff? But then the moment a worker walks outside and steps into a car or they're doing a job on the side of the road or some of this, does the same focus on safety apply or does it break down? So it's really about bringing everyone together, thinking about the conditions, the requirements, the jobs, where the risk exposure is going to be, and then making sure the workers are getting there as safe as possible. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I couldn't understate the, the engagement piece or, or overstate the engagement piece, sorry, enough um, and, and based on practical experience as well with sophisticated fleets and sophisticated organisations because if you, if you don't do that piece well, then you are, you're going to have real issues with the implementation, particularly of new technologies or, or cultural change. Um, and again, I you know I come back to um, examples um, with with vehicles. Um, I, I can think of a fleet that had a very experienced fleet manager and a representative from a large management organisation um, looking at renewing a new tool of trade fleet, and they they did a very good job. Uh, they designed some very uh, safe, standardised cars, good fit out. But when it got to the drivers who weren't involved in the initial consultation, that historic uh, workplace environment that they had, they were resistant to change. And it might be something as simple as um, they didn't like the shelving setup. They preferred the shelving setup to be shifted to the passenger side or the driver's side, depending on what they were doing and who they were. Uh, they didn't like the types of beacons or the spotlights were involved. And one of the issues with that is that uh, th there are different types of organisations. Some, um, some of the corporate structure is very strong and they will design their specifications and they'll go on fleet. In others, uh, the worker representation is very strong and they will be resistant if they don't like those changes, if they're, if they're not suitable. Um, and, and a lot of these, a lot of these requests are quite valid, you know, based on what's happening out there in the field. And, and it's really important to therefore get that engagement. So you've got the, the driver or the occupant central in that VEN there because they are, they are key to this. If they're not happy in those vehicles, mm -hmm. it can be very difficult for a fleet manager to, to actually operate. You've got to meet the corporate requirements of that fleet. And that could be something as simple as um, you know, obviously being effective and fit for purpose, but the, the representation and branding of that vehicle. Um, absolutely, you've got to hit the safety on the head. You've, you've got to get that um, absolutely right. And I think I'll save it until we move into the next section, but I'll talk a little bit about my thoughts on in-vehicle fit out um, a little bit later. And, um, and that's why... So no, that's what I was going to say, and that's why I guess that well, you're about to go to finance and HR. That's where that accountability bit's really sort of crucial as well. So, for example, if if, if your measures are slightly off, and you could have finances measures versus HR measures um, versus the driver, it can be very very different and be quite conflicting. So, 
Um, if someone's driving for the job all the time, isn't it, isn't it fair that they should have a measure around being a safe driver? Um, and then the other part can also you can also see is say finance may want to look at optimizing an asset. Um, so if they don't really understand the purpose of the vehicle, their focus might be around well, a vehicle's meant to drive; it's meant to cover distance. Yeah. Whereas that some some of these assets can actually be the actually enabler for work. So don't just not assuming thinking that the vehicle is should be doing kilometres. A simple measure change could that be when it's parked up, side open, um, and it's actually delivering a service. Because if you have the wrong measures in place, you'd increase your risk. Because yeah. if the focus instead can be around um, mileage, you'll find workers will say, well, look, I want to retain this vehicle. So rather than doing the logical journey planning is from A to B, they might go A to Z to B to Y to try and keep the kilometres up, which increases the risk exposure, which also decreases efficiency. Yeah, quite, quite right. Yeah, that, that journey management thing is really important. Um, you just raised a really good point. You know, in, in term, it is the workplace and utilisation shouldn't just be measured on the number of kilometres a vehicle travels. You know, how, 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 how often is it out uh, performing a task or supporting a task is, is another important indicator on that. So, um, yeah, that, that's a really important part for the fleet manager in, in having a sophisticated view of that workplace. But in terms of comfort and safety, again, you know, something as simple as a light commercial vehicle with a service body on the back, what are you going to do about the design for the doors on that, on that service body? For instance, um, on the passenger side, which, you know, is curbside, you, you may want a, a standard gull wing type door that just sits there above and it provides shelter from the sun and keeps the rain off them when they're working in the back of that, that vehicle. On the driver's side, for instance, you may still have access, but of course it, it's off the curb or near the roadside. Um, you may have, again, a split, like a bifold um, going door on that. And the reason for that is it doesn't ingress so far out onto the road. It hangs down. It's less likely to you know, take out another vehicle or a cyclist. Or you may decide you want roller doors on the side, but every fleet will have, and every fleet owner and operator will have a different perspective of what they want that vehicle to look like. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we'll have to keep moving, we're both being bogged down too much. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess the, the final one we got in there is culture. And I guess the question I want to draw on this is, is just get people thinking around where they, their organisation sits in culture. And when we're doing the, um, the Grey Fleet piece of work, um, we sort of really touched on this with all, all the organisations involved. And, what they began seeing is, is depending on where you're sitting as an organisation um, along this maturity curve will sort of correlate with the sort of risk exposure that you, that you have. And is that each of these levels, and this is what I'd love to know from organisations that are, that are on, the, um, on this webinar at the moment, where do you think your organisation sits? For example, an emerging one is really, look, you have the adequate sort of systems in place, but you really lack that safety culture, there's poor prioritising, work driving safety, safety behaviour. There's this sort of, it's viewed as instances um, there, these things just happen. It's unavoidable. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, you're just aiming to meet regulations. Um, you go next sort of stage, managing. It's sort of looking safely defined as adhering to the rules and regulations, policies, procedures. Instances are viewed as deviations from the rules. And it's somewhat preventable, um, but it's very reactionary in approach. You then begin going, moving into involving, and that's where a lot of organisations will quite often find themselves sitting an aim for in that sort of sense. And it's sort of moving away from a top-down approach. Employees are really buying in and they're understanding it and they're, getting, they're willing to work with management to improve safety of the organisation. Um, it's really about uh, getting the employees to take some responsibility for their own safety, so getting them out and about. Um, the next sort of level, cooperating. Employees are sort of recognising management decisions can really influence safety. Um, they accept their responsibilities. Um, and near misreporting reporting sort of commonplace, and they can begin moving into a sort of the proactive sort of place. And then continually improving, it's basically the entire organisation's actively managed safety. Injury prevention is a core value. And, and we see a lot of organisations with the NHP, the webinars that we're doing, are sitting around that cooperating, continually evolving sort of stuff. And one of the real mature signals you can say is, is look, they admit they don't know everything. Um, and that, it's a tough place for an organisation to say that. Look, I haven't got all the solutions. I'm still having sort of problems, but I'm putting it out there to see what I can do. Um, and that's where I think the only way you can sort of raise this up and is by getting more and more organisations to share it, to put it out there, and really recognising that safety in no sense is a competitive advantage, but a sort of a shared advantage. And everyone can... The difference is you, a simple thing can save a life in another organisation. 
Yeah. So, what's the starting point, do you think, Tim? Okay, so uh, these, these are the filters that I was talking about. I, I think the starting point is what I'd call a coarse filter, but it's a very good one, um, particularly in the light vehicle space, and that's, uh, that's five-star rated policies. So we start with the safest base vehicle we possibly can, but of course, what happens in fleets is we, we make a lot of modifications. So um, I did mention this right at the beginning, but the four filters that I like to apply in developing a strategy are the safe, does the solution offer the best safety outcomes? Effective, is the solution fit for purpose, operationally effective and innovative? Affordable, does the solution represent whole of life value for money and sustainable? Uh, does it offer the best environmental outcomes? And none of them are exclusive and they all tend to work um, hand in hand on that. So we did talk a little bit about uh, you know, the, the service bodies and things like that. So I won't touch on that again. Um, I will talk a, a little bit about things like uh, the types of cabins, again, in a light commercial vehicle. You know, do you opt for uh, uh, a single cab or a space cab or a dual cab? Every fleet has a different take on why they would do that. Um, for a lot of tool trade fleets, they might look at a single cab. And the reason for that is that it puts everything else that they're carrying out in a safe surface body. I have seen instances where people want a space cab for, for that, um, that type of job. And when they're challenged on it, they'll say something like, well, we carry valuable equipment in the back. So then I would go back to them and say, okay, that might be the case, but how are you going to store that equipment? Because I can see no evidence of shelving or, or uh, boxes that are locked down or anything like that. So it was more about the comfort, but you had an interesting example, Jerome, with, yep. with the use of space cabs for operational purposes, yeah? And I think this really comes around down to the situation of getting people, organisations to understand what is the risk for their employees. And this one organisation, They'll always have a space cab because they operate in regional areas um, throughout Australia uh, in summer. It gets hot, uh, conditions can be rather poor, it gets wet and cold as well. So the approach is, is well, these vehicles, they have one crew cab, space cab that goes out for the sole purpose of being a cool down warm, warm up area. So the seat can go back and the vehicle's always left running and they can cycle their workers through and keep them in a safe, um, safe environment, have a refresh and do it in a nice environment in that way. Because um, you can imagine sitting out in a 48 degree day, putting uh, drilling a hole, doing things like that um, to supply utilities and other areas, it, it takes a lot out of a worker. So the way they keep them going, keep them happy. Um, once again, it's giving them a nice, nice work environment. Not everyone can work in an office that's air conditioned. So um, we're just mindful of time here, Tim. We have to keep moving along. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting one. I will touch just on that in cabin. This is a bit of a hobby horse for me. Um, and, and there is a question about telematics, actually. So I'll try to weave both of these in at the same time. Um, my perspective on in-vehicle is that you want the minimum of distractions. So uh, when it comes to things like telematics being fitted or additional screens, um, I prefer to see them out, out, of, out of the way. Uh, when, a, when a driver is on the road, no matter what the vehicle is, they should be concentrating two hands on the wheel and concentrating on, on what's around them. Um, so I think additional screens are a distraction there. Um, some organisations like the, you know, the, the tablets mounted on the dashboard, there's very limited real estate in vehicles now. We've, we've gone and selected the best five-star vehicle we can. Um, you know, you've got airbags in front of you on either side, you've got airbags to either side. You've probably got a big multifunction display screen in the middle. I don't want to see more Garmin's, more screens in there. I prefer to see it come through that area. So the question with regards to telematics was um, what are the pros and cons of carrot uh, versus stick-based approach to it? My personal preference is the, the carrot. I like the mentoring approach. I think, it, I think it's a really important and it probably gets better results than the stick. Um, the stick also delivers a lot of operational issues. Uh, one of them is that the, mappings, the mapping around the country is not 100% watertight. And you will always end up with issues where you've got a speed event, but you'll check that mapping and it may be a side road, a crossover, a change of, of speed limit and things like that. Um, I think education through mentoring is a better approach than the, the stick. And, you know, some organisations agree with it, some don't. Um, so, yeah, you're quite right. We're, we're going to run a little short on time if we don't move on. <laughs> so there's a lot more we can talk about safety, Jerome. I think we'll kick off on the next topic. Yep. So do you want to touch on effective a bit, mate? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, 
Yeah, it's operationally effective and innovative. Uh, again, it comes a little bit back to, to the engagement piece, and, and that is that the best technical solution is, is not necessarily always the best operational solution. And I think it's really important that, um, or, the, or the cheapest solution isn't the best operational solution. So I think it's really important from a, from a productivity point of view, from a, a workplace experience point of view, that what you're selecting is the best vehicle um, that delivers the service or the product um, and not necessarily the, the cleanest technical solution. So you, you've always got to have a dynamic and flexible solution in your strategy, in your plans, in your initiatives, um, and, and be, be aware of what's happening in the workplace and out in the general community. So, yeah. Well, I guess and from the affordable sort of point of view, mm -hmm. um, some people may struggle with their, their capital budgets or their turnover. And, and I guess even in this current environment now, there's a question going down and the vehicles are being parked up, do we need, really need to go back to the old ways? How can we sort of do it in a different way? You've got to consider around depreciation, FBT, value for money, cost of ownership, but all these other complexities that can sort of flow into it. Um, and then as you're sort of moving forward, how often do you renew it? Um, I know one organisation that does it as a simple corporate social responsibility where they turn it over every two years, whereas other ones will stretch them out sort of four or five years to try and maximise the use of until maintenance begins going up to sort of string it along. But I guess it sort of varies from varies from each sort of one at the moment. So, sorry, child just popping in. <laughs> yeah, you're quite right. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important issue. Uh, but particularly now, I think, I think a lot of things have changed. And you know, even today, I, I'm, I'm really still waiting to see what the the medium terms effect are on the market. Um, we know, you know, there was an absolute stop of, of use of vehicles for quite some period and anecdotally and, and talking to people now, we're starting to see a little bit of movement in there. Um, you know, whether the, um, whether the capital, that the asset write-off um, is working, there seems to be some evidence out in the marketplace that is, but there's certainly been a pause on, on, on purchasing or planning uh, from a, fleet point of view, and you're quite right, some organisations have a very definitive view that they take uh, short-term leases or ownership. Um, they may be quite beneficial for them financially as well, depending on the number of kilometres that they're travelling, but they have a, a very clear view that they are refreshing that car park, so there's that social dividend that goes with it, and I really support that. Um, but there are organisations as well that may struggle from a capital point of view. They may they may be um, suppressed financially and it may be a temporary or a permanent thing. And sometimes what happens is that they tend to sweat out those assets for a longer period, which means that they become older, uh, more prone to, to break down and maintenance. Uh, they do have lower residual values, but that's, that's kind of offset. But the other downside of that is that we're not introducing fresher vehicles with better safety specifications earlier. So... Yeah, it's a balancing act, and that's why I think because we just have to keep moving along. We're kind of sustainable. Yeah, it's exactly it's exactly the same process. If you mm. want to have a look at it that way, look, I, I'd love to see car parks full of EVs or hydrogen or hybrids or whatever it is. As I said, you know, um, fleet is evolutionary, not revolutionary, and we're definitely seeing you know ingress in that space. And I did a little piece of work on planning infrastructure for for one of the uh, uh, one of the government. Um, areas on, on the East Coast uh, a couple of years ago. And I, I was really buoyed by their approach to setting a leadership position in sustainability and the introduction of EVs. And I also right. worked with um, a regional state government department recently that had a very good program in the hybrid space, being that it didn't rely so much on the infrastructure going in. So it's really important in that area in terms of your strategy and your overall planning, but it, it isn't going to happen overnight. You know, there's a lot of things that have got to change, including the availability of more than a small range of vehicles to deliver for most fleets in that space. And I think it's a tough one, like, yeah. it's quite often safe, it's good for business, less fuel use, lower emissions, lower risk on the road if you can turn them over. So I think that's why it's fascinating seeing quite a few not-for-profits, Uniting Cares, yep. Church of Christ, those sort of ones really leading by example, sort of drawing that together. But just mindful, we're coming up towards the end, I'm just going to jump onto the next slide, Tim. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was just looking at we got like was it twelve we've got to have some questions soon, so we'll just fly through this very quickly. How many times when you're out and about, organizations, these are this is a common picture that you see out there. Organizations um, will 
go for these. The, we've spoke about the, cab, the space cab, the crew cab. The moment you do it, there's a whole lot of extra complexities that come in there. And I won't draw it going this very much, but really need to think about what the purpose of the vehicle is. Um, the moment you begin loading up or having a vehicle um, with those extra seats in there, by law, you have to actually cater for the, a bum sitting in that seat, even if the bum's not sitting in the seat. So you can be pulled over and overloaded very quickly. Um, the other point can also be every extra kilogram, and I love, that, love using this one, um, Chris Drew from Central Energy made a point in this one, goes, every extra kilogram that's unnecessary in a vehicle is a deadly projector. Yep. It's deadly mass. And so when you sit there and you think about it, an example I'll give is um, there's a five-star vehicle. It was a bit of an older one. Um, it was overloaded. Uh, it was because you always, I always need that tool. I always need that online. But they weren't doing the journey management plan, those sort of bits, and was involved in a low-speed crash um, at 45 kilometers an hour. But because the vehicle was overloaded, it was actually equivalent to, let's say, a 70 kilometer um, hour crash. But none of the airbags and technology didn't deploy and the driver was severely hurt. So a simple thing like this is really thinking about what is the point of the vehicle and what's the purpose of it. So um, I'll move on because I'm just mindful we're coming to us in. Yeah, look, I agree with that, Jerome. And, and the, the, the aspect of the way that we behave out, out there is that, you know, it's easy for us to load a vehicle up and we do add things. Um, Sometimes we're, we're reluctant to take them on, take them off afterwards. So, um, and also the understanding um, that people quite often have, users quite often have about the capacity of that vehicle. By the time you, by the time you take into account, um, you know, the passenger loads, um, available payload, and then, you know, quite often a trailer is on the back, small businesses, trailer might be on the back, you've got the downforce on the tow bar, then you've got the mass of that trailer as well. It's easy for people to underestimate the the load yeah. that they're carrying and to overestimate the capacity of those vehicles, whether they're four wheel drives, passenger vehicles, or um, yeah, like commercials like this. So that's, that's one big area to have a look at in, in a strategy as well. Um, Pat, we've got a great webinar, there's a great tool, but yeah. we, just, we should probably begin winding up so we get some questions. I think, Tim, are you happy to go with the last one? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And look, in terms of um, roadworks and detours, there's a few that go there. I think we've, we've got lots of case studies that we could use. And look, the first one, and I'm not going to go to it in great detail, uh, when you think you've got it right, nothing could go wrong, was a, was a personal experience where um, we modified a standard vehicle by putting uh, non-genuine non light truck tyres on a vehicle. Um, it went out on the road. This is going back a long ways. And I say, it's the... It's the Royal We. I was a director of an organisation. I had nothing to do with the operation of that fleet. Uh, and it was just one of many fleets that we were managing. But the, um, the individual who was looking after that for us at the time was actually out of a, a tyre franchise. So it was very, very confident in the selection. And so was the employer at the time. We moved it from one location around the country to another different environment. We had a tyre blowout. That tyre blowout um, was controlled, uh, brought the vehicle to a stop. And there was a conversation about the types of tyres it should have in that environment. Between the time that, um, that was, what was decided to, to be done, the vehicle had gone out again with the spare tyre, it had another blowout, it rolled over and uh, an occupant was killed and it was an absolute tragedy. Um, it went through uh, coroner's court as, as it normally did. There were a lot of findings about uh, tyre inflation, um, training, off-road training and also understanding uh, how to do pre-inspections on a vehicle. But a little while after that, um, we were summoned into court. Um, and um, as directors of the company, and we had to fight our way through. Firstly, we had to get our insurer to ensure that we were covered, they did. Um, the, the, link, the gap in the link was that in our processes and procedures, another big part of strategy, our, um, our operations guy had picked up the phone because it was expedient. He'd had a conversation with the, the manager, the employer of uh, the person that was um, the fatality. And instead of putting a file note down, he just put the phone down and went about doing his business. So the weak link for us was that we didn't have a record of That's that. Right. And it ended up costing us a substantial amount of money. So uh, very tragic event. So even if you think you're right, it could go wrong. Make mm -hmm. sure that strategy is absolutely watertight. Um, 
And I guess we'll, we'll just go to the summary slide and get over to questions. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, no, that's, that's okay. Because Thank you for sharing that. As you said, that was a great summary on the roadblocks and, and detours. So yeah, um, yeah, it sort of just yeah. closes us out with the, the why, yeah. the what, the how, the with. Yeah, yeah. So uh, look, again, to come back to it, we started by saying um, four key questions that you should um, ask in the development of your strategy uh, for a safer fleet. Um, you know, why, what, how, and with. And, those are answers. Those are questions that need the answers. Why we mo manage that mobility in the workplace? What standards are applied? How the organisation is going to deliver its services, and with the best tools and resources that you can apply. Um, we then look at engagement. We look at accountability, um, and then we move through into applying our filters. So always at the top of the list: safe, effective, affordable, and sustainable. sustainable. So that would be the summary. Yeah. Great, sorry. So, Mike, sorry, we've got a little bit over. Over to you, Mike. Well, thanks very much, guys. Um, a great presentation. Um, there are many issues that you covered. It's a far more uh, complex area, I must admit, than um, I had uh, thought. Um, and I think the presentation was of itself a Q and A. It was a very uh, <laughs> A nice style there. It reminded me a bit of Planet America, but on a far more interesting topic. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much for that. Um, fortunately, um, we haven't had too many questions coming through. There are only uh, three questions, and we've got about five minutes or so. So I think we can get through those. So I think you've done a wonderful job in, uh, in timing it all. Um, I'm just going to check the technology and see what those uh, questions are. And it was tough because both Tim and I love love to chat. And yeah. <laughs> have we got another couple of hours? I think we've got yeah. we'll, we'll give you a whole we'll give you a whole day next time. Don't we? <laughs> um, so the first question is: um, there are obviously many factors that give rise to driver fatigue in Australia's heavy vehicle fleet. What is your perception of driver fatigue as an issue in Australia's light vehicle fleet, as opposed to the heavy vehicle fleet? Look, okay, I question I again. Or did you get it? That's a great idea. Um, look, I, I, I can kick off with one, which is a bit of an example. Um, and it, look, I, I think the same thing applies. In a lot of cases, um, heavy vehicles um, outside of transport and logistics go out in tandem with light vehicle fleets. So the same, same rules do apply. But the example I was going to use is that we task people to perform a task out on the road. So they, they go out and do whatever they're going to do and take a heavy piece of gear with them. That, that piece of equipment is likely to be in, in a depot. So let's choose um, an elevated work platform for a, an, um, a power generator or something along those lines. The individual gets up in the morning and drives through peak hour traffic to the work site in their light vehicle. They hop in that heavy vehicle, they drive that heavy vehicle out to a work site. They, they've got to think about what they're doing on the road, but they are most certainly thinking about the task that confronts them during the day. They may get out there, they will work in whatever the conditions are, sunshine, rain, wind. They will finish their working day, they will drive that truck back into the depot, they must be absolutely shattered, and then we expect them to hop into their own private vehicle and commute through peak hour traffic on the way out. So whatever we do as fleet operators and owners, fatigue applies equally for those people just driving their own light vehicles as it would to the heavy. So Jerome, you've, you've probably got some... Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think there's... Um, people seem to, once again, out of sight, out of mind, I think it comes down to that maturity of the culture of the organisation as well with regards to how they approach it. Like, as Tim was just pointing out, where you live and your remote, how, how long does it take to drive in? How fatigued are they when they knock off to work? Some of these organisations, when they get, um, especially smaller ones, the work is passionate to make a difference. And I, I, I think it slips through the cracks quite a lot with regards to feed for light, fatigue for light vehicles. That, um, and they're passionate to try and do the right thing for a small business. And they'll just think instead of staying in a hotel or doing those sort of things, we'll just push through. We'll push the limits. I can do it. I'll save the company some money. Whereas really what they're doing is they're putting their organisation themselves at risk instead of doing that. So it can be quite a, a maturity. Um, the other part is, is that fitness for duty. How is that person well rested before they even start? Um, like we, we did a webinar a while ago talking with SPX Protection around this. And you think around, they had a massive fatigue journey they had to go on. 
um, and they had to educate their workers because some of them would drive a taxi and then come drive a, a, um, a vehicle the next night. So, and they'd be doing this back to back and just pushing it through. Uh, and it wasn't until they sort of moved into duty of care, we want to, want to do the right thing, have a conversation. Then there's a question of shift workers and all these other elements. How do you get them home safely? Um, we can really go into this, but we've got a very cool project on the way, underway, which will be announced soon, which will sort of be exploring this in a great way, I think, when it gets out there. So more to come. Yeah, that, that was a great question. Thank you for that. Well, thanks, guys. I think, I think what's happened is that uh, we're just about to run out of time because we've got a, an AGM coming up after this. So what uh, we'll do is honour our commitment um, <laughs> to send you the, the extra questions that came through. And thank you for those uh, to those Pleasure. who actually sent them through. Um, and uh, if you can provide uh, answers to those questions, we'll pass them on. So I've got just a few uh, final things I'd, I'd like to say. Um, um, I'd like to thank uh, both of you, of course, for presenting such an engaging seminar. Thank you very much. It was an excellent seminar. Um, and, can, and please can everyone uh, momentarily um, unmute their microphones and, and uh, provide a, a vote of thanks to, to our two speakers in the way we normally do. Uh, I'll start off. Thank you. I'm <laughs> not sure I've ever, ever experienced that before, but it's going to be a first time. Um, <laughs> so enjoy this can, thank you. Okay, no problem. Please can everyone uh, mute their mics again. Um, and um, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending the seminar. Um, it was very well attended from uh, what Prasanna uh, tells me. And importantly, before I forget, if there are any uh, non-members um, out there, um, we'll be offering you a, um, a complimentary uh, membership for three months of the Australasian College of Rose. So that's a that's a really nice thing um, thing to do. Um, even, even though um, we've done such a great thing for you already in having these two great speakers here, um, and so someone from the head office will send you an email shortly, inviting you to become a um, uh, a member for three months if you'd like to do that. So uh, please take advantage of that if you can. So um, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, hand back to David um, awesome. to, uh, to finish off. And did you have any final questions, Jerome or Tim? No, any? good. If anyone wants to download, we, our Toolbox, pack, uh, Toolbox Talk packages are free and we just released a drive distraction campaign, which we developed in uh, unison with, with Monash University Accident Research Centre and Swimming University. So these are all freely available. So take a chance to, to use these resources and, and keep your drivers safe on the road.